Your Excellency Margaret Beasley, Governor of New South Wales, the Honourable Scott Morrison, MP, Prime Minister of Australia, and the Honourable John Howard, former Prime Minister, Sir Frank Lowy, Chairman of the Lowy Institute and board members of the Institute, Ministers, MPs and Senators, Ambassadors and Consuls General, corporate members and supporters, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the 2019 Lowy Lecture and Dinner. I'm Michael Fullylove, the Executive Director of the Institute. I acknowledge that we are gathered on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to all their elders. Well, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't the Sydney Town Hall look magnificent tonight? Let me ask you, how good is the Lowy Lecture? <laughs> the answer is very good. The Lowy Lecture is the most important event in the Institute's calendar, and we are delighted you could all be with us tonight. Each year, the Institute invites a prominent individual to reflect on Australia's place in the world and the world's influence on Australia. Past Lowy lecturers have included German Chancellor Angela Merkel, Boris Johnson, now the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, former CIA Director David Petraeus, Chairman of News Corp Rupert Murdoch, and two sitting Australian Prime Ministers, Malcolm Turnbull and John Howard, who gave the inaugural Lowy Lecture in 2005. Tonight, we are honoured that a third Australian Prime Minister will deliver the 2019 Lowy Lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> it's hard to keep up with everything that's happening in the world, isn't it? In Washington, we note that the odd connection between the Trump administration and Australia continues. It started with that early phone call between President Trump and Prime Minister Turnbull, which was described as hostile and charged and leaked to the Washington Post. And then Scott Morrison was in the White House when the Ukraine story broke, which is leading to the current impeachment discussions. And now Australia is back on the front page of the New York Times because of a vast left-wing conspiracy supposedly orchestrated by that noted Australian socialist, Alexander Downer. In London, Brexit is going swimmingly, let's say. Uh, here at the Institute, we have been honoured to host Boris Johnson twice. In 2017, he gave an excellent Lowy lecture from this podium. And in 2013, he spoke to a smaller group when he was Lord Mayor. And for that event, I did something I've never done for any other speaker. I actually went to Boris's hotel to pick him up and transport him to the Institute. Not because I was in awe of him, but because I wasn't 100% convinced that he would make it there on his own. <laughs> of course, when we got to the Institute, he gave a typically brilliant speech and he had the audience in the palm of his hand. Meanwhile, in Canada, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, once a darling of the media, is facing a series of scandals. In fact, as someone remarked, it's become so embarrassing that Canadians travelling overseas are starting to tell people they're American. <laughs> amidst, amidst all this chaos, ladies and gentlemen, the Institute has continued to focus on the big international questions. In 2003, our founder, Sir Frank Lowy, gave the Institute two missions, to deepen the Australian foreign policy debate and to ensure that Australia's voice is heard abroad. We are proud of what the Institute has achieved over the past 16 years. And this year has been exceptionally productive for us. We have published influential research on subjects that matter to Australia, including the Indonesian elections, women in jihad, and Russia's pivot to Asia. With Penguin Random House, we published two outstanding new Lowy Institute papers. The first examines the Trump administration's relationship with the West, and the second looks at the backlash to China's President Xi Jinping. The world-renowned Lowy Institute poll provided important insights into Australians' views on issues such as climate change, foreign interference in our politics, trust in leaders, and relations with our neighbours. The Institute's digital renaissance also continues. Last year, I told you about the Lowy Institute Asia Power Index, the most comprehensive effort ever undertaken to measure power in Asia. And since then, we've taken the Power Index to four Asian capitals and to the World Economic Forum in Davos. 
In May, we launched the second edition of the Asia Power Index at the Lee Kuan Yew School in Singapore. Only two weeks ago, the Institute published the second edition of our Pacific Aid Map. This remarkable digital product provides unprecedented transparency in relation to aid flows in the Pacific. We have hosted prime ministers, foreign ministers and scholars in Sydney, Melbourne and Canberra. And our experts have hit the road to participate in debates all over the world, at the White House, the State Department and the Pentagon in Washington DC, at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, on platforms in Beijing and London, at Indo-PACOM in Honolulu, in front of sovereign wealth funds in the Gulf and at the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore. We've launched a new podcast called Rules-Based Audio. And our wonderful online daily magazine, The Interpreter, continues to host the liveliest Australian debates about the world. And our work goes on. Next week, we welcome the 2019 Rothschild Distinguished International Fellow, the prominent American diplomat, Ambassador Nick Burns. And I'm pleased to announce tonight that next year's Rothschild Fellow will be Mervyn King, the former governor of the Bank of England. And in a fortnight up the road at New South Wales Parliament House, we will host our annual Lowy Institute Media Award Dinner, at which we recognise the best Australian media coverage of the world. This year's media lecture will be delivered by ABC Chair Ida Buttrose. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, in recent months, the Institute has returned to our spiritual home at 31 Bly Street. And I would like to acknowledge the generosity of the Lowy family in completely renovating that magnificent sandstone building. This is an extraordinary gift to the Institute, but also to, to Sydney and to Australia. If you haven't been to 31 Bly Street yet, please come and pay us a visit. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our corporate and government members and supporters who are listed in the program for the invaluable support they provide to the Institute. And let me particularly thank the four sponsors of tonight's dinner, Capital Group, Coca-Cola Amatil, National Australia Bank and Centre Group. The Lowy Lecture is a huge effort for us and we couldn't pull it off without the support of these outstanding companies. Finally, to all those who follow the work of the Institute, thank you for reading, sharing and commenting on our research, for attending our events and for participating in the Australian debate on the world. Ladies and gentlemen, to introduce the 2019 Lowy Lecturer, I'd now like to invite our founder and chairman, Sir Frank Lowy AC, to the podium. In this hall, and indeed in this country, Frank needs no introduction. He's the former chairman of Westfield and Centre Group, a past chairman of the Football Federation of Australia, and a former Lowy lecturer himself. His most important qualification to me, of course, is that he is the founding chairman of the Lowy Institute. Everything we have achieved at Bly Street has flowed from Frank and the Lowy family. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Frank Lowy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. When we decided to establish the Lowy Institute <clears throat> nearly 20 years ago. We did this in order to bring Australia to the world and the world to Australia. And I'm proud to, I'm proud to be a previous speaker making the Lowy lecture last year. I'm delighted that tonight, Prime Minister Scott Morrison has agreed to deliver the Lowy Lecture for 2019. Scott Morrison is the 30th Prime Minister of Australia. Previously, he was Minister for Immigration and then the Treasurer. And of course, in May, he won the unwinnable election. Oh, come on. Perhaps the re-election of the Morrison government signals the end to the revolving door in the lodge. Well, I certainly hope so. <laughs> Australia needs stability. As a country, we need a good government 
and stable government. Australia needs to succeed and be stable. Last year, was, I was honored to give the, 29, the 2018 Lowy Lecture in this beautiful town hall. In my remarks, I argued in, in, in favor of immigration, innovation, and building infrastructure to make Australia successful and bold. I think we should move this up a bit. <laughs> I didn't exactly say what was up there, that was the problem. <laughs> I do that from time to time. Now I look forward to listening to this year's Lowy Lecturer. Please join me in welcoming the Prime Minister Scott Morrison to the stage. Well, thank you very much to Frank and everyone who is here this evening. I, I can assure you that I'm totally signed up to the Sir Frank Stability Club when it comes to the revolving door in the lodge. Can I begin, though, by acknowledging the Gadigal people? Can I acknowledge elders past and present and indeed emerging? Can I also take the opportunity to acknowledge any serving men and women in the Australian Defence Force that are here this evening as well as any veterans who are here tonight and simply say on behalf of a very grateful nation, thank you for your service. To Your Excellency, the Honourable Margaret Beasley, the Governor of New South Wales, and Mr Wilson, of course to our 25th Prime Minister, the great John Howard. It's wonderful to have you here, John. Sir Frank Lowy, Chairman of the Lowy Institute, and Michael Fullylove, the Executive Director. To colleagues in particular, Matthias Cormann, the Leader of the Government and the Senate, the Minister for Finance, who I note is the longest this week, became the longest service serving Finance Minister in the Commonwealth's history. Congratulations, Matthias. <laughs> He's a very modest fellow and he will pay me back for that, I have no doubt. To all of those who have gathered here this evening, it is a great honour to be giving this lecture this evening, which bears the name of a great Australian. Sir Frank Lowy. When we see and hear this name, we're reminded of what is possible in Australia. Sir Frank, you had nothing, yet you built an Australian empire that reached far beyond our shores. Above all, your name and your life reminds us that our most valuable inheritance is always found within, in our character. And we should acknowledge on a night like this that your character owes so much to that of your own father, who we discussed at our table tonight. A man who suffered to death at Birkenau because he would not be parted from his talit, his prayer shawl, and his tefillin, the leather boxes with verses from the Torah. What character, what faith, and because of that faith and that example, his son has become a great blessing to our nation. While your childhood, Sir Frank, was darkened by the Holocaust, your eyes have always remained defiantly bright with hope for the future. And in your speech here last year, you said this, the list of our blessings is long and that you believe Australia has never been in a better position to influence international events and to benefit from them. I pay tribute to the great Sir Frank Lowy. Now, as a politician, my instincts and passions, I've got to tell you, are domestic in nature. Despite, though, what has been reported of my activity on planes over the last year. But I am not one who naturally seeks out summits and international platforms. 
But as Prime Minister, you must always be directed by the demands of the national interest. As has been the case for Prime Minister's past, so much of Australia's future right now is being shaped by events and relationships well beyond our borders. Australia cannot be indifferent as a bystander to these events that impact our livelihoods, our safety and our sovereignty. We must, as we have done previously, cultivate, marshal and bring our influence to bear to protect and promote Australia's national interests. So tonight I'd like to talk about the new and challenging world that Australia faces and how my government is responding to these challenges. We are living in a world in transition. The former US Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson has described this as an unusually delicate moment in time. I think he's right. A new economic and political order is taking shape about us. We have entered a new era of strategic competition amongst very great powers. A not unnatural result, I must say, of the shifting power dynamics that we've been observing in our modern, more multipolar world and the globalised economy. There is much inevitable about all of this. It's a time of technological disruption, some of which is welcomed, some resented, some feared. A time when global supply chains have become more integrated to an unprecedented degree and more of our economies are dependent on each other through global trade than at any other time, including the major powers economically of the United States, China, Japan and of Europe, of course, as a bloc. There is both the promise and the threat of automation and artificial tech intelligence. There are fears, overstated at least in my opinion, of technological bifurcation, a sort of economic iron curtain apparently coming down. It's also an era of continuing security threats. These haven't gone away. Terrorism, extremist Islam, anti-Semitism, white supremacism, and just generally evil on a local and global level, which is never far away. An era where pragmatic international engagement based on the cooperation of sovereign nation states is, I believe, being challenged by a new variant of globalism that seeks to elevate global institutions above the authority of nation states to direct their national policies. A polarisation within and between our societies an area in which elite opinion and attitudes have become disconnected, unmoored from the mainstream of their societies and a sense of resentment and disappointment emerging which we can see in the polities, particularly of Western democracies. An era of insiders and outsiders, threatening social cohesion, provoking discontent and distrust. Now, whether directly or indirectly, these changes impact Australians' lives. It's not theory, it's real. Our jobs, what we earn, our living standards, and the essential services we rely on that all depend on a strong budget and a strong economy. On our environment, our oceans, our coasts, our grazing and pasture lands currently so devastated by drought our water resources, our soils, all depending on upon our practical conservation. On our safety, that depends on our national security afforded by our alliances, our defences, our diplomatic and intelligence capabilities, our adherence to the rule of law, and most importantly, our ability to enforce that law. G'day to Mick Fuller, who's here tonight, New South Wales Police Commissioner, good shy man. on our freedom that depends on our dedication to national sovereignty, the resilience of our institutions and our protection from foreign interference. It's quite a list. But you know, dealing with uncertainty is not new. You'd think it was the way you read about it. This is not the first time our children have grown up in a time of global tension and disruption. This is a context and perspective I fear is too often missing in our contemporary discussion of global issues and threats. 
my generation, grew up under the threat of nuclear Armageddon. Hoping, as Sting put it, that the Russians love their children too. My parents' generation grew up during the greatest global conflict in world history, including the Holocaust. The invasion of what was then Australian soil in New Guinea, the bombing of Darwin, and Japanese sub in Sydney Harbour sinking ferries. My grandparents grew up during the war to end all wars, where every neighbourhood knew the cost as 60,000 Australians were killed in action and missing out of a population of not even five million at the time, and who then went on to endure the Great Depression before backing up to fight to defend our freedom, most particularly in my grandfather's case, in the Middle East and the Pacific. Now, those generations recognised these as existential challenges of their time, and they were, but they responded with a practical resilience and optimism a resolve rather than the anxiety-inducing moral panic and a sense of crisis that we sometimes frankly see too often in some circles today. At every stage we should have confidence because we have played in Australia our part as a force for good and we have prevailed in partnership with those who shared our outlook and our values. The key to our progress was individual, like-minded sovereign nations acting together with enlightened self-interest. The Marshall Plan, the rebuilding of Japan, the Colombo Plan, a cooperative and respectful internationalism. On occasion, these efforts were forged through international institutions established to serve the states that form them. On other occasions, the work was done by looser coalitions of partners. But in all cases, it was the principled action of nation states, most often led by the United States, binding together the liberal democracies of the Western world. And in all cases, these actions were underpinned by the common values that anchor these societies. As I recently reminded the United Nations General Assembly, these shared values filled the vacuum to win the great peace, to provide the stability to achieve the prosperity and extend the liberty essential for this human spirit to thrive. Now, we can never be complacent or take comfort, though, that the achievements that have been won are permanent. They require eternal vigilance, as we're reminded every time we walk into an RSL. To preserve this legacy in the face of the uncertainties of our modern world, we must simply first approach the future with the same optimism, confidence and resolve of previous generations and through our commitment to the values and beliefs that have always guided our way. Now, the approach my government is taking is based on this. Firstly, know who we are and know what we stand for and allow this to drive and guide our constructive engagement in and the expectations of our international cooperation including those global institutions, and ensure that our national interests remain always paramount. Secondly, to build a strong and open economy here at home, connected to global prosperity, enabling our capacity to protect and pursue our national interests. Thirdly, know where we live and work to promote stability, prosperity, engagement in our own region, the Indo-Pacific by championing the common interest of sovereignty and independence as the natural antidote to any possible threat of regional hegemony. And finally, maintain our unique relationships with both the United States, our most important ally, and China, our comprehensive strategic partner, and keep them in good order. And by rejecting the binary narrative of their strategic competition, and instead valuing and nurturing the unconflicted benefit that can arise from our close association with both. We don't have to choose. Knowing who we are and what we stand for is as true today as it ever was, and we will continue to bring clear objectives and enduring values to our international engagement. Freedom of thought, expression, spirit, faith, 
our humanity, inalienable human rights, freedom of exchange, free and open markets, free flow of capital and ideas, freedom from oppression, coercion, freedom of choice. We don't talk about these things enough, probably with our kids, you know. And they are under threat, not just from the direct challenge of competing worldviews that are profit around the place, but frankly, the complacency of Western liberal dem democratic societies who've forgotten too often that they owe their liberty and prosperity to these values. Australia does and must always seek to have a responsible and participative international agency in addressing global issues based on these values. But it has to be a positive and practical globalism. Our interests are not served by isolationism and protectionism, but it is also does not serve our national interests when international institutions demand conformity rather than independent cooperation on global issues. The world works best, we believe, I believe, when the character and distinctiveness of independent nations is preserved with a framework of mutual respect. And this importantly includes respecting the electoral mandates of their constituencies. We should avoid any reflex towards a negative globalism that coercively seeks to impose a mandate from an often ill-defined borderless global community. And worse still, an unaccountable internationalist bureaucracy. Globalism, in a positive light, facilitates, it aligns, it engages rather than directs, enforces and centralises. As such an approach can only corrode, I think, support for genuine and sustained joint international action of, what we, of which we want to be a part. You know, only a national government, especially one accountable through the ballot box and the rule of law, can define its national interests. We can never answer to a higher authority than the people of Australia. And under my Prime Ministership, Australia's international engagement will be squarely driven by Australia's national interests as it has in the past. To paraphrase, John Howard, the Prime Minister, who is here with us this evening, as Australians, we will decide our interests and the circumstances in which we seek to pursue them. This is a great philosophy of the party which I lead, and it's important in our international outlook. This will not only include our international efforts to support global peace and stability and to promote open markets based on fair and transparent rules, but also other global standards that underpin commerce, investment and exchange. When it comes to setting global standards, we've not been as involved as we could be. We cannot afford to leave it to others to set the standards that will shape our global economy pursued through these institutions. So I'm determined Australia will play a more active role in standard setting. And I've tasked the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade as well as our incoming uh, ambassador to the United Nations with a, uh, a task with DFAT undertaking a comprehensive audit of global institutions and rulemaking processes where we have the greatest stake and to get us involved. And I want to send a message here tonight that I'll be looking to those in this room and other places to tap on your expertise, Australian expertise, to assist us in our efforts. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the foundation for robust and credible Australian engagement abroad is of course dependent on a strong economy at home. Without one, you can't protect the living standards of our people. Without one, a strong economy, you can't keep our people safe, protect and preserve our environment, guarantee the essential services Australian rely on, and you can't invest in national defence and global order. That's why bringing the budget back into balance and keeping it there is so important. A strong budget is a cornerstone of Australian sovereignty in an uncertain world. We intend to maintain it. We are one of only 10 nations with a AAA credit rating from all key rating agencies. At the same time, we are pursuing the most ambitious trade strategy in Australia's history. One in five Australian jobs is now dependent on trade. That's why I get on planes. We have concluded or are negotiating trade deals with 17 out of our top 20 trading partners. We are working towards an agreement with the European Union. And we stand ready to swiftly secure a trade agreement with the United Kingdom as soon as they are in a position to do so. And post Brexit, the UK, I believe, will become an important partner and global voice in our shared advocacy for rules-based trading systems and the benefits of open and fair trade. 
In the last six years, we have secured duty-free or preferential access for our exporters to an extra 1.7 billion consumers. 70% of Australia's two-way trade is now covered by our trade agreements, up from just 26% when we were first elected in 2013. Today's trade data confirmed once again it's the longest consecutive run in monthly trade balances in 45 years. And for the first time since 1975, our current account is actually in surplus. We're working to revitalise and modernise the global trading system to ensure it matches the speed of change in e-commerce and embraces opportunities of the digital economy. At home, we are lowering taxes, removing the burden of overregulation, embarking on an overdue structural reform of our vocational training sector, an important reform to ensure we are meeting the dynamic skill needs of our growing economy. And we are building the transport, energy and water infrastructure our economy needs to grow. Transport infrastructure alone, over 100 billion with almost 10 billion this year. This is all part of the comprehensive national economic plan we're implementing to keep us, our economy strong. Now thirdly, ladies and gentlemen, of course our approach to the world is shaped by where we live. We are an Indo-Pacific nation. We are playing our part to build a secure, prosperous and inclusive Indo-Pacific of independent, sovereign and resilient states. We have started with our Pacific step up. Australia's national security and that of our Pacific family, our Vavale, our Fana, are intertwined. This is a practical partnership supporting economic stability and prosperity and strengthening resilience and security. Our relationships with other nations in our region are flourishing. We have just concluded a landmark economic partnership agreement with Indonesia and the implementing legislation will be in Parliament when we return. And I look forward to attending the inauguration of the re-elected President Widodo later this month. In August, we further strengthen our relationship with Vietnam, a nation of real consequence in our region. Last year, we elevated our relationship with Vietnam to a strategic partnership, and that reflects our shared strategic interests and determination to expand our cooperation even further. ASEAN is at the core of our conception of the Indo-Pacific. Next month, we, our Asian partners and other nations in the region, hope to conclude the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which will embrace 16 economies with a combined population of 3.5 billion people and a combined GDP of $25.7 billion US. The special importance of this agreement is that it will draw India more substantially into the Indo-Pacific economic community. India is a great success story of our region, a land of durable institutions and shared values with Australia. It makes them a natural partner for Australia. So I have been very honoured to accept the invitation of my friend Prime Minister Modi to visit India in January, including to deliver the inaugural address at the Racina Dialogue. This visit will be accompanied by a business delegation that I have invited Ashok Japert, who is here with us tonight, who as chair of the Australia-India Council Board to lead that delegation. This will bring government and business together to pursue our India economic strategy that has captured the intention of our Indian partners and we must now realise it. My visit will be another step in cementing India in the top tier of Australia's partnerships. Last week, we took another step when foreign ministers of the Quad countries, the United States, Australia, India and Japan met in New York together. This was the first time the Quad has met at a foreign minister level. Our government has worked patiently to restore trust and confidence following the Rudd government's decision to disconnect from the Quad. Now, I'm pleased we've been able to restore this important forum for Australia and the region. It is a key forum for exchanging views on challenges facing the region, including taking forward practical cooperation on maritime, terrorism and cyber issues. It also complements the role of ASEAN and ASEAN-led architecture in the region. And this has been achieved with Australia's steadfast friendship and support from Japan, which is broader and deeper than ever. Japan is our special strategic partner, our second largest trading partner and a fellow ally of the United States. Prime Minister Abe is not only a great friend of Australia, but also one of the region's elder and most eminent statesmen. And that's why I'm also pleased to accept Prime Minister Abe's invitation to meet with him in early next year in Tokyo. 
And I also intend to put more effort into our relationship with the Republic of Korea, building on our significant trade, energy and infrastructure ties. And I again met recently with President Moon and we have agreed that our relationship has significant further potential, including in hydrogen, critical minerals and security. And of course, we would simply add that in the Indo-Pacific, it would be even far stronger if we're able to support Japan and Korea overcoming their current tensions. Ladies and gentlemen, I can report from my most recent visit to the US at the kind invitation of President and Mrs Trump that the state of our relationship with our biggest and most significant ally is strong. Our alliance with the United States is our past, it's our present and it is our future. It is the bedrock of Australia's security and it's one that we contribute to as we undertake the greatest peacetime recapitalisation of our defence force ever and increase spending on defence to 2% of our GDP. We carry our own weight in this relationship and that is respected in the United States at the highest level. Deep US engagement in the Indo-Pacific is essential for maintaining stability and prosperity for Australia. But even during an era of great power competition, Australia does not have to choose, as I said earlier, between the United States and China. China is our comprehensive strategic partner. The strategic importance of our relationship is obvious and clear. China is a global power making significant investments in military capability as a result of its extraordinary economic success. It is the major buyer of our resources globally. It has a profound effect on the regional balance of power. It's now the world's second largest economy, accounting for 16% of world GDP in 2018. The world's largest goods exporter since 2009 and the world's largest trading, trading nation since 2013. It's the world's largest manufacturer. It's the world's largest banking sector. It's the world's second largest stock market and the world's third largest bond market. Not bad for a developing country. And the world's largest holder of foreign reserves. We have benefited massively from economic rise in China. That's why we celebrate it. Just as China has benefited from Australia's reliable supply of high quality energy resources, agricultural goods, and increasingly services, it's a two way street. We both benefit. It's why we've got a comprehensive strategic partnership. China has in many ways changed the world in my lifetime. So we would expect the terms of its engagement with the world to change also. It's a natural consequence. That's why when we look at negotiating rules of the future of the global economy, for example, we would expect China's obligations simply to reflect its greater power status. That's a compliment. It's not a criticism. And that is what I mean when describing China as a newly developed economy. The rules and institutions that support global cooperation must reflect the modern world. It can't be set and forget. You've been very patient. And in conclusion, let me simply say that we will continue to stand up for Australia. We will continue to defend Australia's reputation at home and overseas. We will defend our interests, we will defend the jobs of Australians, their living standards, the environment they live in, the cohesive and tolerant society that we celebrate, the world's most successful immigration nation and multicultural society, our kids' opportunities for the future. We will strive to protect what I call the promise of Australia to every Australian, a promise that was made to a young Frank Lowy to enable him to become everything that he could be. That promise is now being kept to millions more Australians who have come to this wonderful country to make a contribution and not take one, to respect our laws, our unique lifestyle and freedoms and make Australia stronger. And who along with all Australians continue to make our nation the envy of the world. So to conclude, how good is Australia, Sir Frank? And may it ever be so. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Here.
Well, thank you, for Prime Minister, for, for delivering a very substantive lecture, one that will be read closely in Australia and in foreign capitals in coming weeks. This is, I think, the fifth time you've spoken to the Institute. You spoke to us twice as Shadow Immigration Minister, as Immigration Minister, as Treasurer, and now as Prime Minister. It's quite an upward trajectory. Uh, I think the timing this time has been particularly clever on our part. Um, and let me go to the United States, if I can. Sure. Um, you're just back from a successful... Are we going to do this on the phone, or...? <laughs> it's not too soon. <laughs> <clears throat> Perhaps. Some congressmen think it is too mm. soon. But, but PM, you're back from a successful US visit. You had the first state visit, uh, the first state dinner with the president since Mr. Howard and, and George W. Bush. You're one of very few Democratic leaders who has struck up a really warm relationship with the president. What's your secret? I know who you are. I know what you're about. Listen and take everybody you know, at their word. I mean, you do not naive about these things, but people are people. It doesn't matter whether they're presidents or kings or queens or um, whatever role they happen to be in. Uh, these engagements, I said this recently when um, we had all of our heads of mission in Canberra, and I reminded them that while it's terribly fascinating for them to write voluminous cables dissecting the great strategic shifts of our time. Their fundamental job was they're in the people business and their job is to connect with other people in the governments they're trying to connect with in the countries where they're serving us. And my job's not much different to that. Uh, we, you know, we get tremendous support from you know, the institutions and I know there are many uh, of our senior uh, leaders in our public service here tonight and I thank them for the great job they do. But uh, it is about making those connections and uh, being as uh, upfront as you can be, um, not giving people surprises, um, and listening carefully. And how do you find President Trump as an interlocutor? What's he like to negotiate with? What's he like to talk to? He's pretty straight up. <laughs> He's, I mean, I, Frank and I were chatting before. Um, I, when I first met Sir Frank, I was in the property industry, so I suppose that gave me a good insight. And uh, you know, people, I find, can often be quite trans transparent. And, um, you know, it, it, the job's made a lot easier because, you know, it was, it was, you know, personally very kind for Jenny and I, and I thought Jenny did an amazing job, um, to have that personal invitation to go and share that evening. But, you know, it, it wasn't about us, and, and frankly, it wasn't about him. <laughs> And, and Melania, and Melania did an, an, an amazing job. The attention to detail that she put into that night expressed a lot about the respect they had. But it was about the respect for Australia, and I'm sure John felt the same way when he was at a similar occasion many years ago. The respect between Australia and the United States is deep. It's forged in the most extreme of circumstances. And when I was meeting with investors in New York on the Friday, some of the biggest investors in Australia, their constant message was Australia. We trust you, it's stable, it's safe. We share values, it's predictable. We are the safe port in the storm. And in a global economy that looks like the one we're currently in, I'm happy we're us. This week we learned that the president called you about um, regarding Australia's role in the 2016 election and potentially the, the Mueller investigation. And you said yesterday that, of course, we said we'd, we'd grant the request and you'd do that to an ally. That makes sense. But can I ask you, isn't it, isn't it inconceivable, the idea that someone like Mr Down or a former Conservative foreign minister would be in cahoots with the deep state in various allied countries to intervene in the US election? I mean, isn't, isn't it a ridiculous proposition? <laughs> well, I thought you summarised it well in your, your, your introduction. Alexander's always been a big lefty, as, as we know. Um, <laughs> Him and Nick Minchin, big lefties. <laughs> the woke pair, I think, I think not. Um, but putting that to one side, look, the, the fundamentals of this are pretty straightforward. It wouldn't matter which president or which attorney general for an Australian prime minister was conducting an official investigation into whatever matter. It 
it would be extraordinary of any prime minister in those circumstances to deny what was a very straightforward request. And frankly, one that had already been communicated by our ambassador that we were happy to uh, cooperate with because A, we're not a party to the investigation. B, we're not the subject of the investigation. And C, we haven't got any issues. <laughs> so if this assists that issue to come to sort, some sort of close, which is a matter for US domestic politics, well, fine. Our simple granting of a very reasonable request to our most deeply entrusted and respected ally is, uh, I think, a, a fairly um, uh, un unremarkable event. All right, let me ask you about China, if I can. Um, China is now a huge media story in Australia. Every day there are front page stories about China, whether it's um, you know, Hong Kong or Xinjiang or political donations or cyber hacks or foreign investment or the detention of Australian citizens or the trade war, it's just relentless. Mm. So can I ask you, how does a democracy like Australia, how do we manage a relationship with a nation like China that is so different from us, that is run by a Leninist political party? In our national interests, full stop. That's how you do it. And you need to know what they are and how they're impacted. I think one of the ways we are, I contend, successfully managing this relationship is just being incredibly consistent. We know where our lines are. We know where our benefits are. We know where they're shared. We know where we disagree. Uh, we are careful in the way we engage in what we say and what we do. Uh, we don't concede. We don't step back. Um, and you know, in any relationship, stability is incredibly important. We're not a variable in this relationship. And we're not a variable because our government has a very clear understanding of what our national interest is and who we are and what we hope to achieve and the stability we seek to um, foster in the region. Stable region, everybody wins. I don't think a prime minister's been to China since, what, about 2016? It's been a while. I was, I was last there in... Um, as treasurer in 2017. Do you hope you'll be going to Beijing soon? Well, I'd be happy to go. But, you know, I'm not waiting by the phone. Um, and nor should Australian Prime Minister be. Um, if, if they would like to invite us to come to China, we'd be happy to go. And I'm pleased by, you know, in the last month, we've had two meetings between our foreign ministers. Our trade ministers have been meeting. I spoke to the ambassador just the other day. Um, so. I think we should be careful about over-interpreting uh, some of those events um, and, uh, you know, we'll continue to, to engage in the, in the way we have and, and we're happy to go, but at the same time, if that, that doesn't transpire, then it's, it's not troubling me. You mentioned in your speech that China had changed the world in many ways in your lifetime True. and we saw that even in the last week we saw these two incredible demonstrations of China, Chinese power. You saw the ICBMs mm. rolling through Tiananmen Square and you saw Hong yeah. Kong demonstrations being put down mm. by authorities. I mean when you look at that aren't there worrying overtones from those two demonstrations of power? Well they're, they're not hard to miss. Um, and you need to be very wide-eyed in understanding all the points that you've just made. And particularly the situation in, in Hong Kong has, has been troubling for some time and that's why we have been counselling um, restraint. Broadly, very broadly, you could say that it's occurred, but not always. And we would hope that constraint and restraint I should say, restraint would, uh, would prevail. But the fact that China has become such a strong economic and military power, I'm constantly surprised at the surprise about this. I mean, what was the point? Everybody said we should, and this happened you know, a generation ago and more, let's engage with China, let's bring them into the, the global community, let's end the exile. What, did we think we were doing that for them to stay exactly where they were? That their economic development would not lead to some of these other things and change the bow balance in, in our region? I mean, whoever wrote that paper 
that said it wasn't going to end up like that. I hope it's not still working for the Australian government. Mm. Well, um, they didn't work for the Lowy Institute. <laughs> I mean, th this is what I find surprising. This is the, the inevitable result of the path that we deliberately got on. And so I think it's important in responding to it is not to get too emotional um, or uh, outraged that this has occurred, but simply to practically understand it as a natural consequence of where the world and the global economy has got to. See, when you look at it like that and go, well, okay, so the trade rules have to be adjusted to res respect that. And the balance and cooperation of nations that sit with India Pacific, well, that'll change a bit. Um, but if you look at this as some great ideological struggle between two worldviews, well, that can take you to a very dangerous end. And I don't subscribe to that analysis. I don't think it's in Australia's interest. Finally, let me bring you closer to home. Let me ask you about the Pacific. Mm. You've been quite unusual, actually, for a Prime Minister in, in making the Pacific your signature foreign policy sort of region early on. I think, for example, today you announced you'd be going back to Fiji next care. week, which I think is the third or fourth time in a year that an Australian PM has stopped in Fiji. Why do you feel so strongly about the Pacific? Oh, there are many reasons, and personally, um, I have a deep connection um, with the Pacific, and some from when I was a very young boy. But that's really not the point. Um, the point is that our Pacific family and their success, their independence, their, their sovereignty, their resilience is important to Australia because it creates a stable arc around our, around our domain. You know, the Pacific is not our domain, it's their domain. But our domain, our waters, our, our territories. And th this is the same reason why I think one of Australia's greatest uh, achievements um, has, was the Ramsey Initiative, um, which the former Prime Minister Howard sh should be absolutely um, proud of. And you know that when I was in, the, in the, the Solomons recently, and I was standing at the uh, parade ground of the, uh, the Royal Constabulary, this is a Royal Constabulary that Australians trained, built. And at the very moment when their nation was facing its greatest test since the, the, the events that led to Ramsey, uh, an election held, an uprising and a revolt that sought to overturn an elected government, the one thing standing between democracy and stability prevailing in the Solomon Islands and those rioting on the streets was the Royal Constabulary that was trained by Australians. And they stood up. They're national heroes, and they should be. But Australia should feel very, very proud. And everyone who served, whether in a police uniform, a DFAT uniform, a military uniform, whatever they did, they should feel very proud of that precise moment, because you know, history often comes down to those moments, and that was 16 years in the making. An arc of stability, of resilience, of independence, of sovereignty um, in the Pacific is very important to Australia. We saw what happens many, many years ago when the Pacific falls and when the Pacific is the target of aggressors. It's very important that we maintain those bonds, and the stronger they are, um, the better Australia is and the greater our national interests are served. The underlying part to it, though, frankly, is we are family. That relationship goes beyond, I think, any other. Um, it is a deep family relationship, and that's how also it's seen. Families also argue, and there was a lot of noise. Sure, that yeah, they do. There, there, there were a few family arguments at, at the Pacific Islands Forum mm. in Tuvalu and criticism of Australia. Yep. Is there any sense that our climate policies are a drag on our influence in the Pacific? Well, one of the things I was pleased about at the Pacific Islands Forum is it was a long night. Um, but it also gave me the opportunity with all the other leaders to take, through, take them through what we'd actually been doing, which they were not aware of. And the Prime Minister of Samoa in particular said, look, could you actually put that down on one sheet of paper for me? I've never heard that before. They have responded um, to many things that they understood to have been what Australia's position was and actions was, but was surprised to learn of the, the detailed information I was able to provide to them. And, uh, but that said, I understand the deep passion 
and, uh, and feelings that they have on that particular issue. And that's why I was at pains to stress to them how seriously we take it and, and what we do. Um, whether that will ever completely satisfy some, I think is an open question. But is it impacting, I think, fundamentally the nature of the deep relationship we have as a family? No, I don't. I mean, Frank uh, Barney Marama and I have an excellent relationship. Um, he wasn't terribly happy with me that morning. He was texting me from the plane the second he got off back in Suva, quite friendly. Um, that's the nature. There's give and take. There's respect. I respect the fact that he feels as strongly as he does. I'm certainly not offended by it because um, I know he's speaking it to me from a deep place of conviction and how can I do anything other than respect him for that? Final question, PM. You've travelled quite a lot as Prime Minister. You've visited a lot of countries. What, 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 has been, what has been the most memorable moment on the international stage that you've had as PM? Would there be one moment that sticks out? Yeah, and it happened in Australia. Uh, standing in the silence beside the Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, as we laid a reef in Darwin. Uh, it was intergenerational. It was beyond current events. It was a moment of, uh, it's a very emotional thing. It was a moment of generational healing, an act of grace from a, a great leader for which I will be forever grateful to him for. Well, thank you, PM. Thank you for taking our questions. Thank you for showing, for telling us a little bit about what it's like um, to be to be the prime minister. I want to I want to wish you luck on behalf of everyone here as you represent our country. I will come back in a little while to introduce Penny Wensley to move a, a formal vote of thanks. But before I do so, can I please ask you to join me in thanking the PM for giving such an important speech and for taking my questions? Thank you. Okay. 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 Thank you. You got me then. Ladies and gentlemen, to move the formal vote of thanks to the Prime Minister, I'm pleased to call upon one of the Lowy Institute's board members, the Honourable Penny Wensley AC. Penny had a long and distinguished career in the diplomatic service, serving as Australia's Consul General in Hong Kong, Ambassador to the United Nations, Ambassador to France and High Commissioner to India. She also served as Governor of Queensland from 2018 to 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Penny Wensley. Your Excellency, the Honourable Margaret Beasley, Governor of New South Wales, Prime Minister, Your Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic and Consular Corps, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's my privilege as a member of the board of the Lowy Institute to propose the formal vote of thanks this evening to the Prime Minister for delivering the Lowy Lecture for 2019 and for sharing with us aspects of your views, Prime Minister, and those of the government you lead on the management of Australia's international relations and on the conduct of foreign and trade policy. It's an additional privilege and a personal pleasure to be able to propose this vote of thanks in the presence of the founder of the Lowy Institute, Chairman Sir Frank Lowy, and of former Prime Minister John Howard, whose memorable landmark address in 2005 on Australia in the World launched this annual lecture series. At that time, John Howard had been Prime Minister for nine years and could draw on considerable experience on the international stage and of dealing with regional and global challenges to shape his thinking and produce the thoughts and the vision that he laid out to that first Lowy Lecture audience. In your own case, Prime Minister, just 13 months leading the government, not yet five months since the federal election, and with big domestic preoccupations and challenges 
to address, and you've already reminded us that that's the core focus for you, including the floods and the fires and droughts that have been ravaging so many parts of Australia. I actually thought when we discussed on the board uh, whether we could extend an invitation to you, I, th I thought that you might say, well, no, I'm pretty busy and this one can wait. Uh, I also thought maybe your advisors might say to you, well, maybe next year. But the thing is, you didn't say that. You took it on. And you have delivered handsomely for us this evening in presenting a clear, strong message about the way in which you and your government intend to pursue the conduct of Australia's international relations. There's been enormous interest and commentary on your most recent overseas travel, and just as much about one place that you haven't yet visited. But even though you said you really don't relish this aspect, you explain to us why you get on planes, I actually think it's a pretty impressive record of stepping up to do things on the international stage that you have given us in the 13 months since you became head of our government, in the not yet five months since the federal election. There have been a few references as we've been going through this evening in your own lecture, in the Q&A with Michael, but I think it's very important for commentators who are really absorbed about international relations to step back from the focus that they give on in surges and in patches on some of the things that you're doing and have a look at how much territory, literally and figuratively, that you have covered in stepping up to deal with these international issues and challenges since August 2018. By my count, 18 international visits to 16 countries, five summits, and you said you don't seek out the summits, but they want to hear from you and you were there. ASEAN, APEC, G20, twice, G7, five visits to Asia, including very deliberately and symbolically as your first overseas visit as Prime Minister to our nearest neighbour, Indonesia, and we've heard tonight that you're going back again shortly. Six visits to the Pacific. Again, sending some very strong signals about the importance of the Pacific. One flying visit to the Middle East, to Iraq. One to South America, Argentina. Two to Europe, and one most recently to the UN, and in every location, Prime Minister, you've added a little more definition to the picture and a much clearer sense of the ideas guiding your approach. I always find it very instructive to go back and read the maiden speeches of our parliamentarians. And Tonight, listening to you talking about a strong Australia and Australia being a strong nation was very, very reminiscent of your maiden speech delivered on Valentine's Day 2008 when you said, I want to share the values and the vision I intend to bring to the House. My vision for Australia is for a nation that is strong, prosperous and generous, strong in our values and our freedoms, strong in our family and community life, strong in our sense of nationhood. 
there was a consistency in that message tonight that I think will be very reassuring to many people. You gave us some nuances. There are some things that are going to be poured over by the commentators. I think there will be particular interest, for example, in your talking about negative globalism. I think there will be particular interest in your expression of determination that Australia will play a more active role in international standard setting. And there were a number of other things. Uh, and I'll leave that to all of you to go back, reread the lecture, and identify for yourself where those nuances are. But above all, what I liked was the strength of the message. This was a message about stability, pragmatism, an assertion and a defense of national interests, an overwhelming message about practical partnerships and our approach to the world being shaped by where we live. There was another thing that you said, Prime Minister, in your original maiden speech in the parliament. You said, I like my history in high definition, widescreen, full, vibrant color. Well, we certainly got some high definition tonight, and I think that screen and our perception of the way in which you intend to pursue the defense and the promotion of Australia's national interests on the world stage and in our region is very, very clear. High definition, widescreen, with just a touch of color, particularly in your Q&A with Michael at the end. Prime Minister, my sense is that this wouldn't bother you in the least from what you said about your visit to the US. We couldn't match tonight the 19-gun salute, the massed military bands, or the singing sergeants that fated you at the White House, but we have produced tonight in this historic setting of the Sydney Town Hall, an absolute capacity crowd, keenly interested to hear what you had to say. Keenly interested to know how you intend to prosecute the defence and the promotion of Australia's interests in the future. You delivered a strong message tonight. You maintained a strong tradition of this Lowy Lecture. For that, we are most grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in expressing warm appreciation to the Prime Minister for his presentation of the Lowy Lecture for 2019. Thank you, Penny. You captured it very well. High definition, wide screen. They like their wide screens in the Shire. Let me, let me add my thanks to the, P, to the PM, to Penny's thanks. Thank you, Prime Minister, for doing us the compliment of giving us a really substantial lecture, but also of agreeing to do the Q&A and showing us a little, bit, a little bit of the human emotion with that anecdote about the meeting with Shinzo Abe in Darwin. Uh, the PM said to me afterwards that he prefers Q&As to lectures, they're more fun. So quick as a flash, I asked him to come back and do an in-conversation at the Institute. So uh, in, a, in, a, in a year or two, we'll see if we can get him back to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to take the opportunity before I finish to thank my outstanding colleagues at the Lowy Institute. The planning for an event like this takes months. And I'm proud that we have pulled off such an exceptional undertaking so soon after moving back into 31 Bly Street. Everyone at the Institute has contributed to tonight's success, but in particular, let me thank Sarah, Andrea, Jen, Ali, Sophia, Erin, 
Alastair, Lara, Lydia, Tara and Stephen for putting on such an elegant evening. I'm really grateful. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for joining us tonight. We look forward to seeing you at 31 Bly Street soon. Have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>